Let's bring in attorney Misty Maris and former FBI special agent and attorney Stu Kaplan. Uh, who's playing prosecution, Stu or Misty? Oh, well, me tonight, Chris, surprisingly. All right, so, so Misty, you are way smarter uh, than I am. We both know that. But did I come close to stating why the prosecution started this way and what's their strongest foot on this? Yeah, absolutely. So keep in mind, the prosecutors have to prove that Penny had a reckless disregard for human life. And in their opening statement, they made it very clear. They're not focused on the initial interaction between Daniel Penny when he restrains Jordan Neely. Their focus is that he held him down for five minutes and 53 seconds after that. The prosecutors say that's when this turned from maybe something that was justifiable to something that does not fulfill uh, the, that standard and that it was not proportionate to the threat. And Chris, to your point, there's two other things that prosecutors are relying on. First is that Penny has special training. He was a Marine and he also practiced martial arts. And the last, and Chris, you nailed this, it's that statement, I put him out. Prosecutors have to show that in his mind at the time, he was aware that there was a risk to Neely's life to cause death or serious bodily injury. So putting all of that together, that shapes the prosecution's narrative, and they needed to get this tape out right from the very beginning with that statement to set the stage for the rest of the case. I don't know, Stu, that Penny puts on a case in chief. He puts in an affirmative defense, as everybody should know. The defendant doesn't have to put on a case. He can just question the prosecution's case. Do you think that will be enough? And how, if so, uh, how so? How would they question the prosecution's case to create doubt? Chris, the utilization of a carotid chokehold is a restraint technique. It is not the deployment of deadly force. You are told and you are taught that it could lead to death if misapplied. The other thing that you are taught is until full compliance is achieved, that is the bad guy is placed in handcuffs, you maintain the position. So just, be just because you see Penny maintaining the position with his arm around the carotid artery does not in and of itself mean he was applying pressure to the carotid artery. And I would say it's analogous to when a police officer uses deadly force. After they shoot someone, you will always see them put that person who needs medical assistance in handcuffs first. Why? Because you have to gain restraint or control over that individual because mm -hmm. that same person can get up and bring the fight on again. Let me also say something. Mr. Penny was entitled to use self-defense. The self-defense is an absolute defense if, in fact, he is justified to perceive a threat to himself or others. I think there was a perceived reasonable threat, meaning that Mr. Neely was saying, I'm going to kill you or I'm going to kill someone, and that led to Penny utilizing a restraint technique. Now, it's a very unfortunate situation. Now, Chris, I will tell you what was shocking and most compelling to me in the release of this body camera recording is the lack of urgency on the New York City Police Department. And if I was to find fault anywhere is the fact that there was lack of any rendering of CPR or deployment of mouth to mouth because everybody was more concerned about what this guy may give them as a contagious disease. And it may turn out now that the d delay in rendering, you know, real triage to this person is the reason why, unfortunately, Mr. Neely succumbed to the carotid chokehold. Um, what is the role, Misty, of the other two? And if, you can address whatever you want. But the other two guys there, I feel like they never get any attention in the analysis. You know, how relevant is it that they weren't trying to stop Penny? They weren't saying, oh, you're doing too much. Uh, one of the guys seems fairly sophisticated in terms of how he, you see how he's bracing his own hand and that wrist lock he's using? That's a learned technique. So how relevant are they? 
They're very relevant. So just to unpack a couple of things, one distinction between this case and other cases we've seen is Daniel Penny is not a police officer. So it's going to be a slightly different argument, both on the defense and the prosecution, as far as whether or not this was an appropriate use of a chokehold, which in New York, it would not be. But that's really not relevant to this particular case. To your point, Chris, this all breaks down to whether or not Penny had a reckless disregard for human life, which is why prosecutors aren't focused on the initial restraint. They're focused on that 553 after. And the two other individuals who are involved are going to be witnesses. They're going to testify. And much of what's going to come out of that is whether or not Neely still seemed to pose a threat. Why hold him down that long? Uh, and some of what we heard in the prosecutor's case is that he was out before that. He had stopped moving, that the train car was relatively empty. So those other two are going to act as eyewitnesses. And to your point, I think the testimony can really cut both ways. Uh, in addition to that, we have other witnesses on the train, which we know are split from pretrial yeah. motions. Some saying that they were concerned for their safety, some saying that this was just another day on the New York City subway system. Well, that, that's because it's gotten rough, okay? And they're a little jaded. But um, I gotta tell you, I hear that guy, I mean, we gotta go, I'm out of time, which is like the dumbest excuse on TV. It's like, I can use the time however I want. Anyway, I gotta go to a commercial. But, you know, hearing that other guy, you know, Jordan, Daniel Penny is sitting there, has got him in the chokehold, which is somewhat of an incomplete um, rear naked choke he has him in. He actually doesn't have it applied in a way that would make you think that he was trying to kill the guy or that he is really good at the chokehold, by the way, because he isn't. But the idea of this other guy, you hear him saying to somebody, nah, he's fine. He's all right. We got him. We're holding. The guy who's holding his wrist tells another passenger who's like, oh, is that guy okay? He's like, yeah, no, he's good. He's calm. Daniel Penny's hearing that too. What role does that play in what was reasonable for him to believe? Stu? Misty, thank you both, and have a great weekend. Appreciate you. We'll go through this whole trial together, and I look forward to you helping me understand it. Four minutes.